Hello there, my fellow Inner Sphere engineers, and welcome back to some Battletech lore. Continuing with the trend of part 2 on Great House Battle Armor designs, today we return to House Marrick and the Free Worlds League. Only two topics for today, but one of them is among the most famous designs in the Inner Sphere. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the Longinus and the Copus. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator. And without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? The Longinus masses at 1 ton and a cost of 425,000 sea bells. This particular design was the Free Worlds League attempt to duplicate elemental battle armor. Although they were not able to match the original Klantek machine, it was the closest any Inner Sphere design came at the time, thanks in part to the help of the Word of Blake. Initial development began in October 3054. However, due to the advanced nature of the Longinus' construction and the bureaucratic wrangling between the League and its Blakiest allies, the process reached the prototype stage much later than the comparable Inner Sphere standard. In April of 3056, the first suits were ready for testing. Unfortunately, that debut was a disaster. During a live fire exercise, the armor composite protecting the suits shattered and the suit's power system should fail at random without warning. It was eventually discovered that a hidden Comstar sympathizer was the cause for all the problems. Following their elimination from the development team, the suit underwent a series of redesigns and new prototypes were ready for testing in early 3057. The Free Worlds League military, however, was not satisfied with these early models. While it could leap in the air via jump jets, just like the Elemental, the Longinus did not carry the Backpack SRM launcher. Other Inner Sphere design teams which had attempted to match these two capabilities found the suits too ungainly to control on the ground or in the air. At the insistence of the military, the Longinus development team spent another 8 months trying to solve the problem before coming up with a solution. The suit would have both jump jets and the SRM launcher, but the former could only be used after the latter was expanded and jettisoned. By this point, the project had gone way over budget, and the military was weary of providing any more resources. Only when the Captain General Thomas Marrick personally authorized extra funds to cover the expenses, and when IBMU agreed to defray some of the cost in exchange for Blake's technology, did the mass production of the Longinus finally begin in December 3057. The first suits were ready to go in Operation Bulldog where they proved themselves in combat against the elementals they were inspired by. Korean Enterprises and Kaliyama later picked up production of the Longinus too, making the suit quite a common sight in the FWLM. Even garrison forces were given a few Longinus suits, while some elite units had multiple companies of the battle armor. Despite the significance they provided in the battle armor's development, Captain General Marrick was unwilling to supply the Blakes with the Longinus, especially not for their planned invasion of Terra. Although afterwards Marrick's stance softened somewhat, and significant numbers of the Longinus began to appear in the World of Blake militias. Equipment-wise, the Longinus came closest to mimicking the capabilities of the actual elemental suit which inspired it and was considered, at the time, the best ever built by the Inner Sphere. The right arm of the suit ends in a modular weapon mount, which can carry a standard small laser, a flamer or a machine gun. After 3063 it could also carry a David light gauss rifle. Its left arm ends in a battle claw and features an anti-personnel weapon mount, which can carry a light weapon for use against unarmored infantry, such as a submachine gun. Most importantly, the suit features an integral SRM-2 launcher, carried on a detachable mounting. Safety mechanisms prevent the Longinus from engaging the jump jets while the launcher is still attached, but once it is jettisoned, it can make leaps of up to 90 meters at a time. Jettisoning the launcher is also required in order to make anti-mech attacks. Finally, the launcher carries only one round of missiles, due to the additional safety mechanisms taking up all the space. If you're asking me, that's way too much effort for just a couple of SRMs. Maybe invest in more armor. The Longinus was also revolutionary for carrying an advanced armor composite, which almost perfectly matched the clan's composite on their own suits. 
The 360 kilos of plating covering the Longinus is enough to withstand a full blast from a large laser and keep the trooper alive. It was also responsible for the tremendous price increase of the suit as the new manufacturing processes were required to supply enough of the material. Come 3069, the magnetic variant of the Longinus came up. This one finally replaced the detachable SRM pack and modular weapon mount for magnetic clamps. One machine gun and one heavy machine gun. For increased anti-infantry firepower and the ability to be carried by non-Omnimax. Maybe one of the most interesting variants of this thing is the so-called Longinus Hacked. This is an experimental refit of the Longinus built in 3079 by one Mark Chiphead Japalucci, a tech of the Principality of Regulus. This guy was working in conjunction with Apple Computers Interstellar to help rebuild the Regulus military using salvage technology. He took a standard Longinus, reduced its jumping ability to 60 meters, shed 120 kilos of armor, and limited the weapon payload capability. However, he was able to install an experimental battle armor c 3 i system captured from the word of Blake. These hacked models could carry either a light machine gun or a David Light Gauss rifle in their right arm and still carry the AP weapon mount and the battle claw in the left. Although effective in extending a sensor network and providing targeting data, this was a huge trade-off and it did not make it worthwhile. The second of today's battle armors is the Copus. This one is a much bigger boy at 2 tons. When the Longinus factory from Etna Foundries from Oriente was sabotaged by Blakist operatives, Thomas Hallas became keenly aware of a need for alternative production facilities. Hallas approached Starcor to provide the manufacturing base. Their Emrys 4 facility had been producing industrial exoskeletons for some time, and they had a good reputation. They were also more than willing to produce a battle armor of their own, or at least try. Previous attempts to move into this market had been stymied by the Free World's government and likely Blakeist influence to maintain control of the League's battle armor design and production. Securing manufacturing facilities was only the first problem though. Powered exoskeletons were one thing, but to produce a high-end assault suit required a lot of technical know-how that Starcore did not yet have. They would solve the problem by reaching out to Duchess Alice Rousey Marek, and in exchange for access to production units, she agreed to help acquire the technical know-how that Starcore needed. Using her extensive resistance network, Rousey Marek was able to contact a leading scientist from Iran Battlemax. Having escaped the Blakis controlled Iran, but still on the run, this Dr. Hiram Sundahar was more than happy to accept employment with Starcore and would quickly head up their new Battle Armor Research Division. With Blake's technical documents, also obtained by Rusei Marek's resistance, Sundahar quickly had a prototype assault suit ready for field trial. Released only days before the final assault on Terra, it was the only Copus that saw limited use before the liberation of Terra. This anti-personnel variant was built to deal with the fanatical word infantry expected to defend Terra's urban centers. It replaces its twin medium lasers with a pulse laser and a flamer. The first of these were fielded in late 3077. Assigned to the 12th Atrian Dragoons under the direct command of Alice Rousey Marek, the suits were there when Alice liberated Outreach. In a set of brief pitch battles, Wanamaker's Widowmakers were devastated by the Dragoons and other units of the Free Worlds Group 1. The Copus suit saw their first combat when a mixed company of Widowmakers attempted to break out of Ruse Marek's encirclement. Two squads of them were dispatched by VTOL ahead of the retreating mercenaries. The Copus, or Copi maybe, used their heavy battle claws to quickly drag debris into the roadway and then laid an ambush against the retreating company. When the Widowmakers slowed to navigate the debris field, 16 lasers lanced out to cripple and destroy the leading and trailing elements of the retreating mercenaries. When coalition forces arrived two minutes later, the eight Copus suits had destroyed 80% of the Widowmaker company for the loss of only three suits of their own. The Copus was present at the liberation of Terra in significant numbers and has since become the backbone of the Marek and Oriente battle armor units. Using the highly capable suit as a bargaining chip, 
Oriente is selling the Kopi suits to the Republic in exchange for access to the Achilles and the Phalanx designs from the factories in Republic space. It is believed that pairing the Kopis with the Advanced Federated Sun's Grenadier designs makes for a highly effective urban defense squad. Based on the assault suit that Iran had been developing, the Kopis stresses firepower above all else. Lightly armored compared to other assault suits, it still has enough protection to equal a standard elemental. The trade-off of protection and ground speed allows it to devote half its mass to offensive equipment. Twin heavy battle claws enable it to rip its way through nearly any armor, as well as obstacles and even buildings. In its favored urban environment, this means it can move nearly anywhere it needs to in order to carry out its primary mission. Moving away from the trend in missile-heavy assault suits, the designers of the Copis were prepared to trade a single salvo firepower for longer battlefield endurance. What they settled on gave both raw firepower and the ability to fire at targets of opportunity without fear of squandering a couple of missile reloads. Two modified Martel medium lasers form the main firepower. These two over-the-shoulder lasers give it the ability to take down 90% of other inner sphere battlesuits in a single attack, and a full squad is a deadly threat to any light battle mech. Two arm-mounted anti-personnel weapon mounts complete its offensive capability. A few other variants of the thing include The anti-infantry variant, this one was developed for the liberation of Terra in 3073, and it replaces the medium lasers with one medium pulse laser and a flamer. The Mark II replaces the anti-infantry model in 3090. It is equipped with two heavy battle claws, two heavy grenade launchers, and two heavy recoilless rifles. It also has improved sensors. The Mark II R was introduced in 3117, and it is a refit of the Mark II. It mostly has the same basic configuration, but downgrades the heavy recoilless rifle to a medium recoilless rifle. The freed space allows the use of reactive armor. Finally, the mortar variant was introduced in 3120, and it uses the 2R as the base. It retains the reactive armor and the heavy battle claws, but all the weapons are replaced by a couple of heavy mortars. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about these two designs, the Copis and the Longinus, for today. I do apologize for the lack of artworks. As you probably figured out by now, we're lucky to get even two pictures of each of these designs, as outside the official drawing, there really isn't much. Fortunately, I can't find pictures of miniatures for some of them, so it's not always hopeless. Anyway, as always, I look forward to reading your thoughts on these two designs. Did you ever use them in your games? What do you like or dislike most about them? Write it all down in the comments below. If you found the episode informative or entertaining, do click the like, share and subscribe buttons for future content. Until next time, have a healthy and awesome day.